Good evening, and welcome to the final session of College of the Atlantic's 2020 Champlain Institute. My name is Lynn Bolger, and I am one of the many organizers of this Ideas Festival. I have been putting COA's summer speaker series together for a long time, and this year, I wanted to focus on the importance of understanding what's at stake in November for us as a nation and for each of us individually, regardless of our political beliefs. I wanted to invite speakers from the left, right, and center and improve our understanding of the values and beliefs that motivate others so that we can work together to fix this democracy. As I mentioned in my opening remarks on Monday evening, this is not so easy to do. Not everyone wants to listen or even feels it is right to do so. On the left or far left, there is the belief that inviting a conservative speaker gives voice and credence to their beliefs. Beliefs that deny the full human rights of the LGBTQ community, immigrants, women, and other groups. On the right or far right is the belief that progressives are using cancel culture to shut down debate and curtail free speech. We invited 12 speakers, their interlocutors, and then an additional panel of people to introduce them. And both sides, right and left, tallied up the number of women, the number of men, the people of color, left voices, right voices, radical left, radical right, they sliced up the speaker's list into little microbytes, a reckoning that both sides deemed biased and unbalanced. We made mistakes and offended both sides. I have stood in the middle and got blasted by both sides. And this is why I want to talk about Dolly Parton. There's a podcast called Dolly Parton's America, which explains the phenomenon that is Dolly. Jad Abunrod says, in this intense divided moment in America, one of the few things that everyone can agree on is Dolly. She is adored by quote, hell's angels and church ladies, the old, young, middle-aged, teens and tweens, and people of all races, gender, creeds. At her concerts, everyone is smiling, getting along, and passing the ketchup and the hot dog buns. There are no fights at a Dolly Parton concert or at Dollywood, her theme park. Here's her secret, though. Dolly never talks about politics. Should we, then, never talk about politics? that Thanksgiving rule of thumb, invite Uncle Arthur with his awesome cranberry jelly, but keep religion and politics off the menu? I still say no. I still say, let's talk about it. As part of its ongoing investigation into the root causes of political polarization in this country, a group called More in Common found that Americans have deeply distorted understanding of one another. Overall, Democrats and Republicans imagine almost twice as many of their political opponents hold views they consider extreme than they actually do. Even on the most controversial, controversial issues in our national debate, like climate change and immigration, Americans are far less divided than most of us think. Oh yes, there's a hard left and there's a hard right, but most of us are somewhere in the big messy middle. And we all want the same things at the end of the day, don't we? We want good schools for our kids. We want meaningful jobs that pay a living wage. We want health care. We want equal justice under the law. We want our parents to be well cared for in their decline. We want to marry the person we love. We want the freedom to live in peace. And we all want our government to work. We want to believe in America that everyone is created equal with the same rights, with liberty and justice for all, 
and Hamilton tickets that cost less than $8.50 a pop. In his book, The Other Wes Moore, the author says, the common bond of humanity and decency that we share is stronger than any conflict, any adversity. I am eager to hear what else he has to say to us tonight, and I am sure you are too. But first, I have to introduce my boss. Darren Collins is a COA president. He is the first alumnus president, having graduated the college in 1992. He went on to get his PhD from Tulane and worked for the World Wildlife Fund for over 10 years. When a notice that the current COA president was retiring, he put his little panda bear PowerPoint presentation aside and started to write his application for the job at COA, a job his wife Karen never thought he would get and so encouraged him to apply for. That was nine years ago and we think she is now acclimated to the Maine winters. I heard of Wes Moore for the first time when my daughter was starting Skidmore in 2013. Every first year student was assigned the same summer read and being the helicopter mom I am, I got a copy so we could talk about it together. The book was The Other Wes Moore and I was transfixed. In 2017, when she graduated college, Wes was given an honorary degree and he spoke at her commencement ceremony there. I've been trying to get him to the college ever since. You're in for a real treat. Wes is the CEO of Robin Hood, one of the largest anti-poverty programs in the country. He is a decorated US Army combat veteran a Rhodes Scholar, a social entrepreneur, television producer, a father, and if you are to believe his Instagram feed, a very mushy, gushy husband. We're here to talk about his newest book, Five Days, The Reckoning of American City, which speaks to this historic moment. Please join me in welcoming the wonderful Wes Moore. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful intro. Oh my God. That's pretty good, right? That was really good. <laughs> Forget this. I just want to keep hearing about this. <laughs> yeah. You that love it, beautiful. don't you? Yeah. But nothing that inspires awesome. humility like being introduced next to Wes Moore. Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> So welcome, Wes, to COA and to the Champlain Institute. How you Aaron, doing? This is my pleasure. I, I, I'm serious. So the only regret I have is us not doing this in person. I am so serious. I am. Uh, it is. It is wonderful being with you. But uh, but I, I've got to get up there soon. This is absolutely gorgeous. Well, absolutely gorgeous. Well, you you bring the crabs up here from Maryland. <laughs> and we'll also enjoy some lobster up here, and we'll 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 call it an e a, a, an even deal. But I that I yeah. actually you're in Baltimore now, right, Wes? I am. I am. Yeah. I am. I want to I want to start with I want to start with Baltimore, the city, because obviously I I don't know when people say, "Oh, you're from Baltimore." What's the next thing that comes out of their mouth? The wire. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right? And I watched The Wire, great show, loved it. But when I read your book, I came away with a much deeper, broader sense of what sounds like an amazing city. Yeah, there's violence there, but there's like deep-rooted community. Could you just give us, give us a, a snapshot of Baltimore and why it's so special? You know, uh, I always say about Baltimore, and, and, and sincerely, thank you very much for this. And thank you very much for this cookbook, too, by the way. This is going to be put to very, very serious and good use, uh, and I appreciate that. You know, I, I always say about Baltimore um, that you can't understand me without understanding the role that Baltimore plays. Um, it's a fascinating place. It's, 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 it's not just the, the birthplace of people as interesting and diverse from you know, Babe Ruth to Thurgood Marshall. Um, it's the place where the Star Spangled Banner was written. It's this place that so many moments in American history ran through the city of Baltimore. Um, 
it's also a place where you can almost watch an evolution of America, some of its highest highs, and frankly, some of its lowest lows in one city, where it is the place of the writing of the Star Spangled Banner and Fort McHenry. And it's also the American birthplace of red light. And how literally you were using geography and transportation lines to separate people based on race. You know, it is the you know the the home of, of, of giants like the Thurgood Marshalls of the world and the Billy Holidays of the world. Um, and it's also a place where, if you look at Pennsylvania Avenue in Baltimore, the place where Billy Holiday really got her start, and Ubi Blake got his start. It, it also is the the street that is probably most indicative of urban decay, where in the time when they were performing, it was the hub of black business and, 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 and entertainment and activity. Uh, and now, and after the riots that took place after the death of Dr. King, it's very difficult to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue and know which homes were burnt after the riots of Dr. King, which homes were burnt after the unrest that took place after Freddie Gray, or which ones have just been completely ignored and dilapidated in between those two periods. And so Baltimore is a fascinating place. And, and part of the reason I love it so much too is I also feel like it's a place that's that's small enough that you can wrap your arms around. I mean, it used to be a city of about a million people. Now it's about 600,000. Uh, and so with the exception of Cleveland and Detroit, Baltimore has lost more citizens over a two decade period than any other American city. But it's a place that's big enough that you could do some really interesting things here and people will care because it can be done at scale. And so it's one of the things I just I, I, I love about the nature of my city. And I love about the things that make me so proud to be a Baltimore. Yeah. So five days was written about the murder of Freddie Gray. Uh, tough time, obviously, and the five most intense days following following his death and um I, w I wonder it's you're five years out now right that was 2015 in april right and um has what's changed from from then to now and did did the the trump administration have its have its an impact on on that city yeah i, I mean the honest answer about what changed the the honest answer is not a lot um and that's really been the heartbreaking thing about what we've seen, where there was this rush right after everything happened with Freddie to be able to deal with the immediacy of what happened to Freddie without being able to spend enough time really focusing on what happened to Freddie before he made that final contact with police. Uh, you know, a lot of the conversation that took place in Baltimore was exclusively about what happened that day to him, right? And, and, and I think we saw it where and, and just for those who might not be aware, what happened was there was a 25-year-old young man who made eye contact with police and ran. The reason I bring that up is because only in neighborhoods like Freddie Gray's neighborhood is that a crime. Because if you make eye contact with police and run in an area that is deemed to be a high crime neighborhood, then it is enough to trigger something called probable cause. And so you, he was then chased by the police and arrested. That was a crime because he did it in the neighborhood that he grew up in, which is Harlem Park, Sandtown, Winchester. Had he, done it, had he done it two miles away in Roland Park or in Guilford or in another area, he would have been going for a job. But because he made eye contact with police in Harlem Park, he ran, he was arrested. Um, an hour after he was arrested, he was in a coma. And when he was eventually taken to the University of Maryland Medical Center, he was, uh, it was diagnosed that he had three broken vertebrae and a crushed larynx. And he was in a coma for about a week. And after the week, he never made it out of his coma and he died. And so there were these protests that took place in Baltimore all for about a couple weeks long protests, demanding justice, demanding accountability, demanding an answer. What happened to him? How does a person make eye contact with police and get arrested? And then an hour later, they're in a coma. And even though these, these protests were mainly peaceful, one night, um, they weren't. And it was the night of the funeral. And so when I think about a lot of the conversations that took place in Baltimore after 
that happened after the National Guard was brought in, after the city of Baltimore was placed into the state of emergency. So much of the conversations were about what happened to Freddie and what are we going to do about policing and policing inequity. And all those conversations are incredibly important. And there have been, you know, there have been some movements that have happened on it, even though to be completely frank, uh, you know, we've watched things like, for example, the Department of Justice placed Baltimore under a consent decree. And basically what the consent decree was, and the same thing that happened with the city of Ferguson after the killing of Michael Brown, they actually looked into the Baltimore police force and the Department of Justice found that the Baltimore city police force had a series of patterns and practices that were showing discriminatory behavior towards not just poor, but specifically towards black communities. And they released this huge report showing these patterns and practices of discrimination. And, uh, and frankly, uh, in, in this administration has actually rolled them back, rolled back the consent decrees. Uh, yeah. But the other thing that we did not spend enough time on as a society, as a community, as a city, was being able to break down not just what happened to Freddie in his death, but what happened to Freddie in his life. And that was actually the thing that really motivated me to want to even go through this exploration in the first place, because we were spending so much time talking about how did he die? What happened with the officers? What happened in the back of that police van? All incredibly important things. And the fact that there still is not justice for that is not just heartbreaking, it's unforgivable. But the other thing that I do know is this. This was a young man who was born premature, underweight, and addicted to heroin. His mother battled addiction for much of her life. She never made it to high school. She could not read nor write. When Freddie and his twin sister gained enough weight to leave the hospital, they had to go, they, they moved into a housing project over in West Baltimore. That housing project, along with uh, 480 other homes, were actually cited in a class action lawsuit in 2009 because of the endemic levels of lead inside of that home. Lead. And so this was a young man who was born underweight, premature, addicted to heroin, and lead poisoned. And by that time in his life, he's two years old. And so it's not just that not enough has been done to prevent deaths like the one that Freddie Gray endured. You know, we've done some small things. For example, we know, like, you know, there are body cameras that are now being worn, that type of thing. But we really haven't done enough to present the kind of life that Freddie Gray had to live before he made that final encounter with uh, and, and was then killed uh, after after contact with police. Yeah. So, gosh, the, what what I can't get over. I mean, the book comes out March seventeenth, twenty twenty, and look at what we've seen this year, right? Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, like what would you, how would you have written the book differently um, if you were writing it now um, after, after living these experiences? And, you know, I, I just like, have we not made any, any improvements? I just, I, how are you feeling? You know, I, um, it's, a, it's such a good question, and, and I, I, it's a really good question. I actually went through the exercise about a week ago, you know, even after the book came out. And it's funny because the book was actually set to come out, first set to come out in, in, uh, in uh, April 14, which is around the anniversary of his death. And I remember in the very beginning of March, I called the publisher and I said, I can't do it. I just finished closing my offices. We were the, we were being ravaged by a virus that none of us knew enough about, and I was like, I can't get my head wrapped around what's going on right now. And you know, we were then at that point going on the second week in a row of over over you know over you know I think that time was over five million people a week claiming unemployment, and so I was like, I can't I can't do this. And they said, okay, fine, we understand. And they said, okay, we'll delay it. And they just picked a random date. Damn, they literally spoon back and they said, all right, what about June 23rd? And I was like, great, sounds good. And they thought it was a random date until a few weeks later when we do learn the names Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And there's a horror 
to how timely this thing was. There's a horror to the yeah. fact that you could have released this book at any time and it would have been timely. And so I think about it where I, so I, I went through the exercise actually about a week ago. Um, I wanted to reread the book just to see what would you change? Had you known that these six months that just happened, had you known they were going to happen, what would you have changed? What sections would you change? Would you have swapped into the character? Would you, uh, you know, the conclusions at the back of the book, what would change? And the honest answer is not a word, not a word. And that actually is terrifying because I would have hoped that after having the six months that we would have had, that at least some of the dynamics that I talked about in five days, that we would have fixed them or addressed them or at least begun the process. And that is where our work begins. Where, you know, so at the back of the book, when we talk about the reality that, that, uh, that you know, you look at the issue of lead poisoning and something that, that impacted Freddie Gray, that, uh, that, you know, the CDC indicates that if a person has five microbes of lead in every deciliter of blood, that that person will be cognitively damaged for the remainder of their life and that Freddie Gray had 36. So this was a young man that was, that was mentally and neurologically stunted from the time he was a toddler and the amount of damage that that does to your system, the impulse control damage that it does to your system, the basic cognitive understandings that it damages when it comes to your system. And the fact that we've known that lead is a neurotoxin for over a century in this country. And we still have in the state of Maryland alone, in the state of Maryland alone, tens of thousands of children who are suffering from lead poisoning because of the home they're living in and the water they're drinking. You know, I, I talk in the book about the need for a, a, a truth and reconciliation process within this country. Uh, and, and the distinct reality is, is that we still do not even have a pathway for these things. I and mean, we can talk about, you know, later on about why I still believe that it's going to be imperative for the United States to go through this. And so I'm hopeful in this moment that we actually can get to a better place. I'm hopeful in this moment that we can build a level of momentum that can actually address some of these things that have been chronically challenging for our communities for a very long time. Uh, I just know that we've got work to do because so many of these dynamics we're still very much wrestling with to this day. Yeah. So at one point in your life, and this came up in um, the other Westmore, speaking of truth and reconciliation here, you, you went to South Africa, which must have been really interesting for a young black man to be going to South Africa, anyone, frankly. But is that where the, the root of this idea kind of started to germinate? And what, what would that look like? What, what would that mean for those of us who, or for those who don't really know what that means? How, how would that unfold? It was, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was one of the most magnificent experiences that I've ever had in my life because South Africa had just completed a truth and reconciliation process over the, over the, over the apartheid era. And, uh, and I remember hearing all about it, hearing about what this process was like, who was involved in it, who were the chairs, what did they get out of this process? And it really was examining this, this, this distinct reality that they felt they could never move forward as a nation if they were not able to also grasp and examine their past. And they did it where they basically said, and, and you know, in the case of South Africa, and, um, a lot of these TRCs are different, but in the case of South Africa, they were actually granting immunity to people. And they said, and the only way you're gonna get immunity is if you tell the truth. Because we feel that that is going to be, that's the key, that's, that's the unlocking ingredient. If you can tell the truth, regardless of what you say, but if you tell the truth, that is enough to grant you your freedom. And so, in the, and I remember actually speaking with my homestay mother in South Africa, and you know, she lost her husband to apartheid. He was a freedom fighter. And, and I remember once asking her, saying, cause she was telling me all these stories about her husband and how he's kidnapped and all these kind of things. And I said, you know, how do you forgive like, how are you, she's the most forgiving, loving woman. And I said, how do you forgive knowing all these things that were done to you and to your family because of the color of your skin? 
And she literally, and she, and, and, I, and I won't forget it. She literally just looked right at me and she said, because President Mandela asked us to. And it took my breath away because it was so matter of fact and it was so simple because President Mandela asked us to. And it wasn't just because of the power of his position. It was because this was a man who was on Rotten Island alone for 27 years and for his crime of not carrying around an identification card that he felt he shouldn't have to carry around. And he was sentenced to a life sentence in prison for refusing to carry around an identification card. And I think about that moment in context where if you were to talk to most political scientists in 1980 and you said, I'm going to give you two countries, one in 10 years is going to be in a complete civil war that it'll basically be a kleptocracy and their currency will, have, will probably have the value of wallpaper. The other one will be arguably one of the most prosperous and growing and thriving democracies on the entire continent of Africa and throughout the globe. And I'm going to give you two countries, Zimbabwe and South Africa. If you ask most political scientists in the 1980s, they would have gotten that wrong. They would have said Zimbabwe was going to be the thriving country. And they would have said South Africa would have been a place that would have been a complete civil war. Because even after apartheid ended, you still had multiple groups within South Africa who all would have been vying for power. And so they're like, I don't see how you patch that thing together. And they, most of them would have said Zimbabwe would have actually been the country that's better off. It was the absolute opposite. And it shows you where leadership matters and it shows you where truth matters. And the beautiful thing about a process of truth and why truth matters is that we've seen this not just play out in South Africa, we've seen it in other countries as well. You know, South Africa, yes, has gone through a truth and reconciliation process. So has Rwanda after their war between the Hutus and the Tutsis and the genocide attempts. So is Northern Ireland, so is Chile, so is Colombia, so has Canada, twice. And so you've seen countries that have had the courage to look at their deepest and their darkest wounds and to understand the need of being able to be honest and truthful about those wounds in order for them to properly move on as a society. And so for the United States to understand that they are, that as, as, uh, as, as Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice said, you know, uh, America's birth defect of slavery. As we all know, the idea that the country and the reality is that the country was founded on a racial hierarchy, that it was founded on so with stolen labor and on stolen land, that these are all things that are real about our history and the fact that it's not just about what happened when it came to the introduction of slavery or the ending of slavery, because after that it turned into reconstruction and black codes and Jim Crow and mass incarceration. And you saw how this thing continued to show itself. And so when you're looking at a lot of these distinct realities that exist right now, like we were talking about with Baltimore, that when you're looking at the entrenched and the concentrated and the generational poverty that exists in Baltimore, it's impossible to understand that without understanding the role that redlining played, or the role that, that, that discriminatory housing policies, or discriminatory lending policies, or the Homestead Act, or the fact that government dollars were used to build up the entire middle class and the suburbs, or the fact that we had a GI Bill that was pulled together, but that the GI Bill was arguably one of the most generous offers and programs that were put together to create the middle class inside this country for people who had served their country overseas and came back and, and earned this benefit, unless you were black. And so these are things that our country has to understand and wrestle with and be able to look at it and say that the, the way we can move forward as a unified group, the way we can stop continuing to address these things and stop addressing the issue and the big, the big elephant in the room of race, the President of the United States has called up the National Guard only 12 times in our nation's history. Ten of them had to do with race. Only twice did it not. The postal workers strike in New York and the, the looting that took place in, on St. Croix after a hurricane. That's it. Every other time had to do with race. If we cannot 
contend with the thing that continues to show itself, that continues to express itself in such, in many ways, such, uh, such, such violent ways and such unproductive ways, then we as a nation then must just be accept and contend with that, that this will continue to compound and get uglier as the years go on until we can have the strength and the courage that many of these other countries have had to deal with the issues that they've had to deal with. Let's do it. Let's do it for sure. Um, listen, I wanna, I wanna wind the clock back a little bit further. Um, when you were a, a young boy and now we're, we're going into the Bronx from, from, um, from Baltimore, um, there's this great scene in your book, The Other Westmore, where you were with your buddy Shay, right? And um, <laughs> it was in your kid Cupid days. And <laughs> I was going to describe it. Well, will you, will you describe it for us and then let me ask the question? Yeah, so my guy Shay, so Kid Cupid um, was a name, uh, and it was actually self-given. It wasn't like I actually heard it. <laughs> but Kid Cupid was his name that I gave myself because, uh, you know, Cupid, and I was this young guy, and all the girls loved Kid Cupid and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, and of course, this was not a name given to me. I gave it to myself. And along with Kid Cupid also came a tag, an identifier. And so... One of the things that happened in a lot during the, uh, you know, particularly during the 1980s and you go to New York, you used to see like the subway cars just full of graffiti and walls full of graffiti. And that's really what people call tagging, where they would go and they tag their name or tag whatever, you know, crew they're with, whatever the case might be. And so, uh, so I remember uh, one day when I saw my guy Shay coming up and Shay had a bag on him and in the bag, he had a bunch of spray paint cans and he was like, you want to tag? And I was like, yeah, of course. So I take out the, the can and I shake up the can and then I start tagging, putting two Ks with a circle around it, which is my Kid Cupid. And we're sitting there tagging and then you hear, and I just hear, whoop, whoop. And then this cop car pulls up right next to us. And so drop, the, drop everything, start sprinting in one direction. Shay's sprinting in the other direction. Um, he was a smart one that sprinted away from the cop car. I, for some reason, again, I was scared, but I ran, tried to ride right past the cop car to get by. They get out and they grab me very quickly and put me on the car and put me in handcuffs and then put me inside the car after that. And then finally they, they probably a couple minutes later, they went, they grabbed, uh, and they got shit. Uh, but that was the first time that I felt handcuffs on my wrists. And that was the first time that I felt that, that, that pinch that happens when they finally close the wrist. And again, my wrists at that time were so small that you know, it's like sliding up my arm. Um, but that was the first time that I felt what it, that I, I had that feeling of what it was like to have your arms behind your back and to know that you have now had all of your movement restricted. And uh, at that time, I was 11 years old and that yeah. was the same. Yeah. So, and thank you for, for describing that much better than I could have done. But um, <laughs> there was one line in, in your book and you said, I couldn't deny it was my own stupid fault, right? Um, but at the same time, that cop, and you must have been scared to death. I mean, oh. I'll admit, I didn't have my own tag, but I got, I got, picked up by the cops when I was young too. But um, the thing that I want to ask you is this balance between you're admitting like this personal responsibility, right? Like it was your own dumb fault. You, you knew, but at the same time in this country now and then there is a structural racism that was pushing you in that direction. Like how do you, how do you balance those, those two things between personal responsibility and the fact that there are these structural underpinnings that, you know, would give me way more second chances than you would have gotten as a, as a young man. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a good question because, um, you know, the reality is that every single one of us needs second chances, right? There's not a single person that has lived their life perfectly or, 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 or done everything right. Every single one of us 
need second chances, and truthfully deserve them. Because a lot of people will make childish mistakes and will do childish things. Um, but that's really where oftentimes the discrepancies do exist and the discrepancies do lie, right? Where, I mean, I, I know that the neighborhood that I grew up in, that we were, that, that, that the issues of poverty surrounded us. And it wasn't just how it showed itself in one way. It was how it showed itself in every way. It was the food options that we had, right? It was the schools that were in our neighborhoods. It was the air that people were being asked to breathe. It was the water that you're being asked to drink. It's the way you were policed. And the fact is, is that for many of the things, and I even got the chance to see it later on, but as I move into different communities or I have friends who live in different areas, and I'm like, they're doing stuff that I wouldn't even try to do it. And there was no police involvement there. And so I was like, it's just amazing how different policing happens and how different policing looks, depending on where you call home. And so, you know, it's interesting because I remember um, right after the other Westmore came out, uh, I received a call from my publisher and they said, well, we have great news. Uh, Nick Kristoff wants to do an op-ed about your book. Nick Kristoff, for those who don't know, he's a, he's a, he's a writer for the New York Times, op-ed writer for the New York Times, a uh, brilliant guy, and, and he's a progressive. And he writes this really great op-ed where he said, I really enjoyed the other West more because I thought it was a great examination of race and class in our society. And then two weeks later, I get a phone call from my publisher. They're like, amazing news. Guess what? Michael Gerson wants to write an op-ed about your book, which your book is the basis of the op-ed. For those who don't know, Michael Gerson is a former speechwriter for President Bush. He, um, and he was a, uh, an, an op-ed writer for the Washington Post. Brilliant guy, a conservative. And he writes an op-ed where he said, I really enjoy The Other West more because I thought it was a great examination of personal responsibility and individual choice. And I was like, oh, this is fascinating. <laughs> Because these are two people who don't agree on a whole lot, who are both saying they like the same story and for two completely different reasons. And so I remember my wife asked me, she said, so who do you think is right? And I said, I think the answer is they're both right. Well, I don't think you can talk about societal responsibility without understanding, though, at the end of the day, people make individual decisions and people will be held to account for their individual decisions, both good and bad, positive and negative. However, you cannot talk about individual decision making without understanding that these individual decisions are being made in a societal context. And that societal context does matter because it also helps to determine how many options you actually have and what the consequences for those actions are going to be. And so yeah. I felt like part of you know that moment was very indicative for me because was what I was doing wrong? Yeah, it was, right? I mean, I was spray painting a wall. Uh, and I'm very, very fortunate that, frankly, that didn't end up a whole lot worse than it could have ended up. Uh, I also don't know that societal context matters. The neighborhoods we are growing up in, it matters because it helps to shape and determine and helps to guide not just every decision you make, but the response to it. And that was a very clear indication of that. Yeah. You know, I guess the same could be said for the kind of tough love. Like you, when you got older, you went to Valley Forge, right? You went to military academy, which was, which was that kind of tough love that maybe you'd say you need. And I'm always wrestling this with, with students I work with, right? There's, um, there is a need for tough love, but I can't just be, it's not just going to be that. That's not the only thing that's going to, that's going to tip the scales. Um, I wonder if I could though, ask now. You, no, but that's important though, because it, this idea of tough love is important because also in many ways, it is a level of preparation, right? It's a preparation for the world. And, and, you know, and, and I, and I, I, I think about that actually in the context of, of, you know, uh, of, of the military, where sometimes people say with the military, and I'm, and by the way, I'm very clear that, um, you know, some of the most important moments in my life have not been when I was wearing a, a suit or wearing jeans or a t-shirt, but it was when I was wearing the uniform of this country. And I'll always feel that way. 
that the military gave me something special. And it wasn't just they made me wake up early and do push-ups, right? That's part of the course. You're going to do push-ups, you're going to wake up early. Um, but it was about the fact they taught me leadership and accountability and how to be responsible for something other than yourself. And that actually did matter. And, and I think about it even in the context of, um, you know, not just with the military, but even with the life that I lived, where I used to think that everything that happened to me was a deficit. I used to think everything that happened to me was like, oh, I can't, I can't compute this person because they had more, or this person grew up with more money, or this person this, or this person that. Without helping me realize, actually what this was doing was, this was my armor. This was the thing that was preparing me for the world. This is the thing that makes me the person I am today, where I will never, ever see anything again in my life that will make me flinch. I don't think I'm built that way anymore. And I think that the reason I'm not built that way anymore is because all the things that would have made that the case has now been stripped away. And so I think there is something that we have to be able to, uh, we have to be able to provide that for our children where, you know, we want them to know that, uh, that, you know, they all have a right to be safe. Uh, but also we want them to be strong. And I do think there is that balance that we then have to think through when it comes to our kids and our children and how to make sure that they are ready for the world. Yeah. Speaking more of, of education, um, one of the, the results of uh, the Freddie Gray murders, the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and, and just the upheaval that we've seen recently has been a real move toward diversity, equity, and inclusion training, right? Especially in, the, in, the, in colleges, here at College of the Atlantic, all, all over the place. And I just, um, I wonder what, and this is, this is me breaking the first rule, like ask, asking a black man what the white man should do to, so I, I, I recognize that, but what, what do you think of, of, of your exposure to DEI and is, is that a good way forward or is that one way forward? What, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think, I think it's, an, it's an important way forward um, because I, I'm also a big believer in, in, in a few different things. One is any movement that has been sustainable and any movement that has been effective has been sustainable and has been effective because at some point, it wasn't just the impacted party that was screaming for their justice, right? So if you think about it, 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 you know, part of the reason that the civil rights effort was so powerful and so important and actually garnered the impact that the civil rights you know, leaders were hoping for was it wasn't just them standing up at some point. At some point, it was people from all backgrounds, all races, all demographics who were demanding and saying, this isn't right that this is about human rights and I'm willing to fight for the rights of other people because their pain is my pain, right? It went from being a sympathetic love to an empathetic love. I think about the case of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and we were talking about South Africa earlier. Part of the reason that the, that the apartheid movement transitioned and eventually became effective was it was not just black South Africans who were demanding justice for black South Africans. This became a global movement where you had everyone from people from all over the world demanding justice to corporations pulling out and saying, I will not do business with South Africa as long as this is the case. And then eventually that prompted the level of change. Whether you're talking about the women's suffrage movement, whether you're talking about you know, uh, the marriage equality movement, part of the thing that made marriage equality movement so effective and so powerful was that eventually it was not just our LGBTQI uh, you know, uh, you know, friends who were demanding and saying, love is love. And that's one thing I feel right now we're seeing even in this moment of Black Lives Matter. Where Black Lives Matter, you know, just a few years ago, there were people for calling for Black Lives Matter to be a terrorist organization, a terrorist organization. This was an organization that was started by three black women after the death of Trayvon Martin, after the murder of Trayvon Martin a young man who was walking home in his own neighborhood and was killed by a person who was this self-appointed community policeman. 
this is something where when we think about this in terms of a context, this idea that, that, that now we're watching people who are, who are rushing to say Black Lives Matter, we see you know, Black Lives Matter Boulevard, we see, we see you know, companies and corporations who are rushing to put this in their mission statement because for so long, it was so difficult for people just to say three simple words mm-hmm. and to understand the meaning behind it. And so one of the reasons that I do have a sense of real hopefulness about this movement right now is that it is not just the impacted communities who are saying Black Lives Matter. It's not just the impacted communities who are saying we have to do a better job of introducing diversity, equity, inclusion into the way we do our work. And it's not just because I feel bad for you, but it's because your pain is my pain is that we can transition from going from sympathetic love to empathetic love. And that's actually a really beautiful thing. And so when I think about what we want people to do and what I hope people can do in this moment is, you know, first understanding that, that this moment requires leadership and frankly, it requires leadership oftentimes in the impact of communities, because if we don't, and if we think that we are then coming in to save, then your altruism will be viewed as something else. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is about how do we share power and autonomy? And I think the other thing that becomes really important in this moment, and, 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 and I love Dan that you brought up you know, the word education, is there does need to be a sense of education within this country. You know, when we talk about black history, for example, in this country, oftentimes it can be framed up in four chapters, right? It's slavery. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's civil right, or it's a civil war, it's civil rights, and then it's Barack Obama, right? And it can kind of get phrased up in four different chapters about the history of race uh, and, and race relations in this country. And it's not only incomplete, it's incredibly unfair and offensive. Because it's, it's really important for all of us, for not just African Americans, but for our entire nation to understand the contribution that African Americans have made to this country. And that yeah. we cannot talk about the beauty and the might and the strength of this country without understanding the unique role that African Americans played in it. And understanding that it's important for not just my children, but it's important for all of our children to know the names Paul Robeson and James Baldwin and Langston Hughes and Thurgood Marshall and Sojourner Truth and Rosa Parks and there are people who help to build the framework of this nation. Many names who some know, many names who not many know, but all people who are responsible for the basic core infrastructure and the basic and broad beauty of this nation. And so this movement towards DEI is crucial. Um, But it's not crucial just because that's what this moment requires. It's crucial because that's what honesty requires. And that's why it's, uh, it's, it's empowering to see people who are moving and taking, taking this work so seriously. Mm. Know your history, right? That was John, John Lewis's in his, in his posthumous op-ed in the times, right? It was, that was the first line of the last, that last paragraph. So beautiful. I want what can I ask you one more question? Then I'm gonna say again. That was a lot of the one beautiful paragraphs in that in that in, in what he wrote. And and if people have not read it, I would ask you to please read this. This is a man who he gave this to the New York Times two days before he died, and he asked them to hold it until his funeral. And it is so beautiful. And but there's one paragraph where he where and, and it includes the words, the truth does not change. It's so gorgeous what he wrote, and I'll just ask people to read it. I've now read it four times uh, with tears in my eyes every single time. It's so well done. We're gonna miss it. Wes, I'm gonna one more question, um, and it's a biggie. So, but um, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna shift to taking some questions from the audience. Um, there was one point um, again in your first book where you were trying to decide whether or not. what was next and you said after weeks of prayer 
I decided to join the 82nd Airborne. And there were a number of, of pieces in, in both books where you reference God and spirit. And um, I don't know, John Lewis does it, does it too. And it makes the hair stand up on the back of my, my neck. What's, what's the role of religion in an increasingly secular world? And I know that's kind of a big one to, to take, but just give, give me a thought or two on that. Yeah, I, um, you know, it's interesting because my, uh, my grandfather was the first, first African-American minister in the history of the Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, this is the official church of apartheid South Africa. Um, this was a church that literally um, condoned apartheid uh, in a rule book in one hand and condoned it and justified it with a Bible in the other hand. And when he first uh, when he first came back to this country, he was actually the first one of my mom's side family born in this country and was run out of the country uh, actually by the Ku Klux Klan when he was just a toddler. The majority of my family pledged to never come back to the United States. But he always did. And he said, you, you know, this was his birth home. This place he wanted to come back to. He eventually came back, uh, received his degree from Lincoln University, uh, HBCU in Pennsylvania, and, uh, and became a minister. And I remember going to church, uh, at the church that he was a minister of, and I would just always sit there and on, on Sundays and hope he was done by 1 p.m. so I could make kickoff football games. <laughs> um but the role of religion really started to play a powerful role in my life, I'd say probably when I was a late teenager, where I started to be able to, be able to understand that none of this was an accident, that we were all going through a process and that God, uh, and again, this is just my opinion, but that God was guiding us. And it wasn't that God wasn't speaking to us. The question really became was, are you listening to what he's telling you? And and you are right where, you know, we're, we are in a world where, um, you know, where, where people have, a, have a, a, a multitude of different faiths and beliefs uh, on all, and, and some have none. And all that should be respected and all that should be, and, and, and the right to have that is something that should be protected. Uh, if you look at some of our, you know, some of the, the first documents that, that this country adopted as whole, uh, you know, to include things like freedom of religion, we see that these are some of the original, original thoughts of the founding fathers. I also, though, know for me, um, I believe deeply that there is something else that's helping to guide and order my steps. I do believe deeply that in this place and in this space and in this world, I have something that I can consistently rely on. That gives me peace. I do know that, you know, when I think about all my experiences, even my experiences in Afghanistan, uh, my grandparents gave me a little small Bible before I left. And inside that Bible, they wrote the words, um, have faith, not fear. And I put that inside my flat vest before I went on every mission. It sat right over my heart. And I remember I'd be going out on missions. And I will you know, just sit there and just sit quietly to myself and just keep on reciting that. Have faith, not fear. Have faith, not fear. Here, have faith out here and we go on our missions and i'm convinced of this day and i will always be convinced that that mattered as i was going out there and i use it still to this day so i know that in a in a place and in a space and in, in, a, in, a, in a world our job and our god honoring job is to honor and respect those no matter what their religious belief is, or even if they have one, it doesn't matter that our humanity is what calls for a sharing of respect. And that's the most God honoring thing to do. I also don't believe that for me, one of the things that I lean on, one of the things that I, that gives me my sense of centering and gives me my sense of peace. It is the idea that I know that I'm not alone. And I know that for much of what I'm being asked to do, it's just to listen because then the answers are there. Right. Love thy neighbor, right? There is something else. Yeah, I like that a lot. Why don't we um, open up 
for the last few minutes um, to get some questions. Um, here's a good one. <laughs> for, uh, if you oh, were you the mayor of Baltimore, yeah, these are good ones. Uh, I'm going to get to, yeah, I think we can do all of these, right? If you were the mayor of Baltimore, Wes, what, what, what is the first thing you would do to improve the lives of the poorest citizens there? Hmm. Um, such a good question. Uh, so I think there's a few things that, uh, that we are going to have to do. Um, and I, you know, I say we, I mean, you know, from, from, from the citizens of Baltimore, the, the first thing I think you're, you're going to have to do is you're going to have to really build a coalition and a consensus on the need to think big and the mood to be urgent on a lot of things that you have to get done. I think part of the challenge that we have for so many people is that when they get into these seats or they get into these offices, there's this level of small ball that happens because they feel like there is not a mandate or they have not personally done the work to be able to build up the kind of mandate that's going to be necessary for the kind of big changes that they need to do. So the first thing you've got to do is making sure that you go out and then you build out, you know, really build up the mandate to go big in a way that is going to be necessary. Then once I think you have a mandate, there are a few things that I think you have to and need to act on immediately. First thing I think you have to be able to understand and act on immediately is this idea that if we do not have a public transportation system that can actually properly move people from one part of the city to another, from where they live to where they can work, when you have pockets of deep poverty where people are living, and then you have places where people can actually find employment, and those two places are completely, not, not just not in terms of distance, but in terms of time. When a person lives in West Baltimore, and it can take them an hour and a half to go a mile and a half down to the Inner Harbor for a job, you know you've got a fundamental problem. And so you've got to invest and invest heavy in mass transit and the ability for people to be able to move around and go to where work is. It is going to be one of the most crucial things that has to happen in order for you to actually create a sustainable economy. We've got to be able to rethink our education system within the city of Baltimore. Um, you know, right now, I think we are going to have a situation where, you know, we spent a lot of time as an organization, as Robin, for example, dealing with things like summer learning loss. But here, and what summer learning loss is, you know, it's the reality that from between the months of June to the months of September, if a child is not getting academic support during that time period, it can take until November for them to catch up to where they left off in June. We now have children who have not had a consistent academic coursework since February because of COVID-19. And we now have children, the announcement we just made, will not go back to schools, in-person in schools, in September we have a risk of literally losing an entire generation of children if we cannot get smart about rethinking everything from school days, school years, teacher pay, all these other things that we know are crucial and important, but that are going to make sure that we can not just make sure this, this education gap that we have is not exploding, but actually being able to use this as a moment to fundamentally decrease it. Every child should have access to a, to a full tablet. We should be working with the tech community to build it out. Every child should have access to Wi-Fi and high-speed internet. We should work with all of our internet providers to make sure that is the case. And then we need to start working with the, the, you know, the state administrators for a couple of the elements and things that we know that we should be, should be, should be lining up. Uh, you know, for example, when we're still in the middle of a deep pandemic, uh, you know, how do we start the conversations about things like the impacts for the relief bill? You know, unemployment assistance, SNAP. Uh, you know, things that the CBO score very highly because these are when you're when you're working with things like SNAP and, and unemployment assistance, this is cash and capital that goes directly back into the economy because you're giving it to people who are going to spend it. And so when we look at the reality that, you know, uh, that that, you know, you look at the reality and take New York as just one example, half of New Yorkers were in poverty for at least a year over the past four years, not half of a borough, not half of a demographic, half of the city experienced poverty for at least a year over the past four years, and that was pre-COVID-19. And so we know that we can do things like adjust, make adjustments on unemployment insurance where a dollar eighty of every dollar, you know, there's a dollar eighty return for every dollar spent. We know that we can use this moment to do things like, you know, make the child tax credit fully refundable. And I understand this is kind of like wonky stuff and detailed stuff, but the wonky and the details matter. And they matter both in terms of helping to support families in their greatest times of need, but it also matters to be able to create pathways to develop real elements and areas of sustainable economic mobility, which is really what we should all be focusing on, making our highest priority to make poverty history, because there is no reason 
for us to have people living in poverty in the way that they are living in poverty right now. All right, one, one, one more question here, Wes. Uh, you know, a big commonality we've seen with some of our best speakers here is, is range. And you are certainly a man with great range from you're a road scholar, you're, uh, you know how to jump out of airplanes, you're a great writer, you're the CEO of Robin Hood. Um, and jump based out of airplanes is actually the easy part. part. <laughs> right. <laughs> landing, right? Landing is the harder part. But um, would tougher. you ever, yeah, landing's tougher. But would you ever consider running for public office? I, 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 I would, I would. Um, but I think there's there's a couple of things that I think thank you very much. Important. That's great, and, and we're going to end. Our... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, but I, I think like, there are some things that do become important. Now, right? Is one is I'm 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 a deep believer in knowing thyself, and I and I don't and when I so for example when I hear people say things like oh I want to run for you know mayor or Congress, you know what it's telling me? It's telling me that you don't know what either job does because they're very different jobs with very different responsibilities, uh, with very different jurisdictional lines. And so I think it's important to understand and to know, you know, what is it that you actually want to do? I, I don't believe in this idea of doing things for a title nor a position. I know people that have no title whatsoever that are doing absolutely remarkable things on this planet. And I know people with really big titles who are doing absolutely nothing. And so, what is it that you want to accomplish? What is it you're trying to get done? And if you feel that something in elected or something in appointed or something or running a nonprofit or running a foundation, as I do now, if you feel that that's the place for you to be, then that's exactly where you should be. And I, I'm proud of the work that we're doing right now. I'm proud of the issues that we are addressing. I'm proud of the families that we are serving. I'm proud of the, the levers that we are exercising in this moment. Um, and I just know that when my time is done, the thing that I want to be said about me was that he never stopped working on an issue that he literally was willing to give his life for. And that is how do we create a level and a measure of economic opportunity for everybody within our society? How do we make sure that the things that we talk about, that, that the founding fathers talked about, in our original documents, that they weren't just words, that they were true, and that we were willing to fight for them collectively, together, that we could actually form and, 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 and that we could actually form a more perfect union. And if that's the thing, and, and, and so my plan, my goal, is to spend my time and my energy and my entire earthly existence to be able to make that real to be able to make that happen. Uh, and, 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 I know, and I have a deep amount of respect for people that do run for office. I think the sacrifice that they are making um, is real and significant. And I think the vast, the vast majority of them are doing it for the right reason. Um, I also know that's not everybody's path. And I think it's a beautiful thing that's not everybody's path. I think what all of us should do is look into our own hearts and say, what's the difference we're trying to make? What's the best way for us to try to make it? And then attack it with everything you've got. And I feel like if we've done that, then uh, then we've done our job. Wes, thank you so much. It's been an honor to, to talk to you. And um, please come and visit us at College of the Atlantic at some point. And um, I just wanted to thank you. It was, it was a remarkable hour and uh, I hope we, we run into each other soon. I plan on it. I want to be intentional about it and I will get up there soon. So thank you so much. Bless you all. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you so much, both of you. And this closes the 2020 Champlain Institute. We have a few people to thank. Thank you, Judy Goldstein and Will Thorndike, who came up with the idea of a COA symposia of ideas at, at College of the Atlantic. We will be sending you a survey. We love to hear from you. Please fill it out. Um, all of the talks will be up on the same viewing page that you've been using to sign in all week. 
um, and COAs and Champlain Institute social media feeds. Thank you to all the people who make this happen behind the scenes. You don't have capes or masks or super suits because you don't need them. Wes Norton, Zach Soares, Harley Bobadilla, Caitlin Meredith, Kenyon Grant, Amanda Mogridge, Judith Tunstadt, and Jen Hughes. Ted Widmer, Francis Dead Sellers, Abby Moffitt, Diana Davis Spencer, and Nick Dowling helped us secure this year's speakers. We thank you so much. What a great lineup. Thanks to all COA supporters. We do this because of you. And thanks to the class of 2020 Champlain Institute speakers. Good night, all. Thank you so much. <laughs>